our understanding of chronic pain has changed dramatically. And we now understand that pain, both acute and chronic, but more so chronic, is triggered by neural pathways in the brain that can be uh, stimulated by anxiety, they can be stimulated by um, conditioning, they, a number of different things can cause those neural pathways to be triggered. It's kind of like how, um, it, it's, it's like a little bit of Pavlovian and that a dog will start salivating when they hear a bell, even though there's no, no food there. We can actually train our brain the same way. Not that we're like dogs, but our brain can get trained that same way inadvertently. Um, there's also an experience where people can uh, experience, can have the sensations of pain uh, based on, and this is where people start to lose me a little bit, but based on emotional repression, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but what, what happens with your brain when you repress an emotion or suppress an emotion is your nervous system gets stimulated and you experience different sensations. Now, some people sweat when they do that. Some people have their heart rate increase. Some people have a hard time breathing. Some people experience uh, pain sensations in their body. So this, I could go, as I said, a lot deeper into that. But uh, what Dr. Schechter is saying there is basically our understanding of pain has changed so much over the last 50 years that we can't just look at somebody's body and say, oh, you're experiencing pain in your arm. That's because your arm is broken. That's it's an oversimplification that we can't we can't rely on anymore because our brain has such a strong influence on the way we experience pain. Thanks for tuning in to the Elevation Recovery Podcast, your hub for addiction recovery strategies, hosted by Chris Scott and Matt Finch. Welcome to the show. This is Matt Finch, and joining us today is Daniel G. Lyman, LCSW, who's a psychotherapist and mental health coach based in Portland, Oregon, in Los Angeles, California. He specializes in the treatment of chronic pain, anxiety, including OCD, depression, and sexuality. He earned both a master's degree in social work and public administration from the University of Southern California. Integrating a sense of humor into all modalities, Daniel works to enable and motivate his clients to take steps towards creating lasting change and eliminating chronic physical symptoms. He has been working in the chronic pain field for nearly a decade and is currently a clinical supervisor at the Pain Psychology Center in Los Angeles and the executive director of Mind Body Therapy Center at mindbodytherapycenter.org. Daniel has worked with thousands of clients to overcome pain on six continents, although he's still waiting on Antarctica. And I myself feel so lucky and forever grateful that I am included in one of those thousands of clients. Around six years ago, I was suffering from chronic pain that would not go away with traditional treatments. But after working with Daniel for around six months, for the first time in many years, I was totally chronic pain free. Here's a quote from mindbodytherapycenter.org. The therapists and coaches at MBTC work online to help clients throughout North America and the world at large. Our understanding of chronic pain, anxiety, and depression has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. We now understand that chronic pain and anxiety are triggered by misfiring neural pathways in the brain. Your pain and anxiety can therefore be decreased and eliminated through cognitive and emotional coaching. Our therapists and coaches are highly trained in the latest research to help you overcome your chronic symptoms, whether that be anxiety, back pain, knee pain, fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, repetitive stress injury, hand arm pain, and many more. And without further ado, I now present you with our guest, Daniel G. Lyman. Welcome everyone to the Elevation Recovery Podcast. My name is Matt Finch, and this is episode 198. Daniel, thanks so much for joining me. This is your second time on the podcast. The first time was kind of, I think within a few months after the launch. And on that first episode for People that haven't heard it, it is around maybe episode 20, somewhere around there. You can go to elevationrecovery.com and the search bar, you can type in uh, Daniel G. Lyman. That episode will also put a link in the show notes page of this episode and on the YouTube description for that and the other resources we talk about. Daniel, thanks so much for coming on again. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be here with you and with Papaya there. Yeah, Papaya <laughs> is here because Ashley's at work. She wanted to be a part of it, and she loves it. She won't say anything. One day I'll teach her how to talk, and then she can be <laughs> She can co-host. be your co-host. Yeah, exactly. That'd be awesome. Yeah. She actually does chime in sometimes, and she'll yeah. say, chirp, chirp, chirp. And I always uh, mention it, too. Whatever I just said or whatever the guest said, if papaya perks up. Yeah. That there was you go. really something really important. Need to, <laughs> papaya was a fan of that. Papaya so is like we, that octopus that can predict who is going to win the uh, 
the <laughs> like whichever soccer match now it's yeah. like papaya can tell you what the most important information is <laughs> oh let's start um i'm not a gambler papaya but if she has that skill <laughs> yeah. let's leverage and start making some money <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> no but we find ourselves here on video podcast and audio podcast this time it's been a little over a year of the pandemic uh, the last time i talked to you you were mostly at the pain psychology center in mm -hmm. los angeles area Oh, yeah, based and in Beverly Hills, yep. Based in Beverly Hills, and you had helped me, for anyone that doesn't know, which is probably most people at this point, Daniel G. Lyman was my pain therapist. I had chronic pain for three and a half years after my opioid addiction. Most people uh, that I've worked with, about 60% of them uh, got on opioids in the first place due to being prescribed them for acute or chronic pain. Yes. And so that's, yeah, that's usually how it goes with me. I used opioids for social anxiety, for energy, for depression, mm -hmm. for euphoria, you know, just to create a shell of protective endorphins and dopamine to go through life. Oh yeah. And then right after I got off about a month later, I had a rotator cuff injury, which turned into chronic pain. And then for the next three and a half years, I would have shoulder pain and then neck the shoulder pain would go away then neck pain then shoulder pain with uh pectoral minor pain with you know trapezoid pain and then it would just go all over the place and it was a long battle luckily mm -hmm. i found the right books the right doctor who introduced me to you daniel and yep, he dr. gave me Schechter. a list he gave me a list of the pain psychology therapists and your name just, oh, you know, check this out. I saw your picture. <laughs> I work a lot on in, on intuition in life. And I knew, okay, now that I've got the diagnosis from Dr. Schechter, mm -hmm. that my pain was tension generated for myself personally, my personal pain. Yep. So nowadays you're up in Portland, Oregon, and you're also doing stuff with Pain Psychology Center. And now you founded this Mind Body Therapy Center. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm still the I'm a clinical supervisor at the Pain Psychology Center, so I'm still heavily involved there. I was one of the founding members of that team with Alan Gordon and uh, Derek Zapico and a few others of us. Um, and I'm I'm still a part of that team. I just decided because of a couple of therapists that wanted to work with me. Now I'm uh, kind of leading the charge, as it were, on a group practice uh, called the Mind Body Therapy Center, focused on the very similar, exactly same stuff really as the Pain Psychology Center, just. Uh, slightly different with my a little bit of my take on things versus you know I noticed everybody's I like, everybody's got a little bit of their own style so I had to bring my own style to it so yeah I noticed that I could tell I was like <laughs> oh this is so perfect it's just it's it's wonderful for me and I think for you as well we're kind of like we worked together many years ago mm -hmm. and I was like a huge success story yeah of overcoming chronic pain yep and then I wrote that article we did a podcast so it's fun we check in it seems you know every year a couple of years and you it's have, just fun to see you how things are progressing very kind and generous to me Matt that is very true you are a very generous warm man that article <laughs> you initially wrote people would be like gosh you must be amazing he spoke so highly of you in that article and I'd be like hey I'm just a schmuck he's just a really nice guy so <laughs> no I was a schmuck when I had chronic pain that, you know so what I actually want to do today is completely different than anything I've ever done cool on a podcast uh, I just got a cool idea. I'm sure you've probably read this book, Think Away Your Pain by Dr. Schechter, his seven lessons of pain. Yes. I want. I would just love to go through some of these and I'll just say the lesson and then I just want you to talk about it. Because, yeah, yeah, that because I listened to you on the podcast, Crushing Doubt, which was mm -hmm. amazing. And I noticed I was like, man, if somebody didn't know about this type of uh, mind body therapy for pain and for other symptoms as well, other types of psychological or physical symptoms, they would have been lost. But it was great for me because I've been so immersed in that information for so long. You know this so stuff with, quite well. You could teach it, Matt. <laughs> oh, maybe I could have a, a few years ago if I did a big, huge, um, you know, a whole week of uh, cramming. And but this will be a review for me. Cool. All right. Yeah, so this will be good for me. I haven't read this book since it came out, so this will be good. It'll yeah, be a good, it'll review. Be a good <laughs> review. And then, you know, what I've noticed also is each specialist, whether it's a doctor or a therapist or even just some, uh, someone that's an author, everyone also kind of has their unique terms. And sp you know what I'm saying? Even the guy that interviewed totally. you uh, on that podcast, he was talking about like 
crushing doubt. First, you have to have mm-hmm. first there has to, you have to get crushed with doubt to overcome right. crushing doubt, something like that. All yeah, right, so here we go. Totally. No, everybody's got their own language, so this will be good. Here we go. Again, this is Think Away Your Pain. Your brain is the solution to your pain by Dr. David Schechter. Great doctor and, based in LA. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's the doctor that I went and had a consultation mm-hmm. with who checked me out for 45 minutes, and he assured me without a shred of a doubt there was nothing structurally wrong with my left shoulder, or maybe it was my right shoulder at that point. <laughs> I love that we it's, can't even remember. That's the best I can't part. Even remember. I love that. Yes. It might have been this one. <laughs> I think nothing it was your right shoulder, neck. but yeah. <laughs> the, one of the most interesting parts was when he laid me down, I think on my stomach, and he checked these different uh, tension points or pressure points, these different yeah. points mm-hmm. all the way down my back. And that was one of the things he's like, oh, yeah, it's tense here, tense here. Yep. So the my whole goal with this session is, number one, if anybody has pain, to go to mind body, uh, center, mind body therapy center dot com, right? Dot org. But, yep, that's great. Dot org. Yeah. Mind body center. Th- uh, it's long. Mind, mind body, body therapy center dot org. I know it's a long one. I might just switch to MBTC dot org. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. I just get I'm kind of dyslexic in far it's as how long. I say things. <laughs> Uh, and we'll put a link also to the article I wrote that has you and David Schechter in there for people that want to learn more. Some people might listen to this or watch this and say, oh, my that's not has nothing to do with my pain. Yep. That's fine. If that's the truth, just dis, discard this. Maybe you'll hear some stuff you like. Yeah. Discard the rest. Ready? Here we go. The seven lessons of pain. Lesson one. The source of chronic pain is often the nervous system and brain not structural injury. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a, a, a very simplified way. And it's good that it's simplified. It makes it clear to people, but it's a simplified way of saying that the, our understanding of pain has changed a lot in the last, last 50 years. And I won't ramble on forever because I could give a two hour lecture on this, but wow. our understanding of chronic pain has changed dramatically. And we now understand that pain, both acute and chronic, but more so chronic, is triggered by neural pathways in the brain that can be uh, stimulated by anxiety, they can be stimulated by um, conditioning, a number of different things can cause those neural pathways to be triggered. It's kind of like how, um, it's, it's like a little bit of Pavlovian in that a dog will start salivating when they hear a bell, even though there's no no food there. We can actually train our brain the same way. Not that we're like dogs, but our brain can get trained that same way inadvertently. Um, there's also an experience where people can uh, experience, can have the sensations of pain uh, based on, and this is where people start to lose me a little bit, but based on emotional repression, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but what, what happens with your brain when you repress an emotion or suppress an emotion is your nervous system gets stimulated and you experience different sensations. Now, some people sweat when they do that. Some people have their heart rate increase. Some people have a hard time breathing. Some people experience uh pain sensations in their body. So this, I could go, as I said, a lot deeper into that. But uh, what Dr. Schechter is saying there is basically our understanding of pain has changed so much over the last 50 years that we can't just look at somebody's body and say, oh, you're experiencing pain in your arm. That's because your arm is broken. That's, it's an oversimplification that we can't, we can't rely on anymore because our brain has such a strong influence on the way we experience pain. So There's a few things I want to uh, go deeper in on there. This is really fascinating. Oh, my yep. goodness. Uh One of the quotes at the beginning is, let's see, here we go. The Let's see, here we go. Yeah, the good, here's a few quotes, actually. Study the patient rather than the disease. The Mm -hmm. physician should not treat the disease, but the patient who is suffering from it. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. Anyways, I know you're not a physician, but regarding, Uh let's, let's start off with the Pavlovian part. Because that one, and I'll just do an example for myself. Mm -hmm. Back when I was experiencing, uh, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. I found certain t-shirts I wore Yes, and certain t-shirts I wore, I would like not want to wear them because it would be more tense up here. Mm -hmm. And, and certain lit laying on certain positions with my arm, a certain position on the couch, watching a movie. I was like, every time I'd lay in a certain way. Yeah. So I really remember that. And I knew I was like, this is some bizarre stuff going on. If, if it's a structural right. thing and it's chronic pain, how come the t-shirt I put on can make it worse? It was very, lots of different things like that. Right, exactly. And if we look at the body and the brain purely from a structural perspective, that doesn't make any sense. Like you'd be able to wear one shirt, but not another shirt. 
that's just not how our bodies work from a purely structural perspective. There is some conditioning there. And every single human alive is subject to conditioning. We can train ourselves to have a certain response with certain things. This happens a lot with food. Uh, people will get worried or, well, here, let me, let me, over, let me simplify this here. Uh, what oftentimes happens, and I hear this every single day, people, someone will eat something and then they will feel bad afterwards. And it happened one time and they will think, oh, I can never eat that thing again. And what I tell people is we want to practice good science here. We don't want to practice bad science. Good science means what we would do is then eat that same thing 10, 20 more times to really see if that is the cause of that thing. But in the human brain, we eat something once and we think, oh my gosh, it must've been because of that I don't know, fish that I ate that I feel sick and now I can never eat fish again. And then because we develop a fear around eating fish, for example, I've had people say like, oh, even just smelling it gives me that physical sensation, whether it be like an upset stomach or a hurt stomach or something like that. And so what happens is we train our own brain to get stuck and to think that we can't eat this one thing or that we can't wear a t-shirt or that we I mean, I, you name it, I've heard people talk about it, like specific shoes. I've had people say, these tennis shoes, I feel totally fine in. These tennis shoes cost 10 out of 10 pain. And they're the same brand. They're just like a year older or something like very, very specific things. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it's and 10 it, out of 10 pain. They're the right. same shoes. more. Or less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, and again, we're all susceptible to this. So this isn't anybody, any judgment on anybody. I've, I fall into this all the time. Like, Again, for me, it's a lot of food stuff. That's why I use that as an example. I'll eat something and I'll be like, uh-oh, I can't eat this anymore. And then I'll think, wait, no, I ate that yesterday and I was totally fine. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the conditioning is strong with all of us. I mean, we, we can see it in other animals like dogs, for example. And again, I'm not, some people would get offended if, we're, if I'm comparing people to dogs, but I love dogs. Um, but we, <laughs> yeah, we can, we can con condition ourselves inadvertently. So one of the things that I work on with people is kind of being a, paying attention to those condition responses that we have and reconditioning, retraining our brain to not have that same response. And it's actually not as difficult as people think it is. This isn't rocket science. It's just regulated exposure to the, net, to the activity. So if I ate that fish and I felt upset stomach that one time, what I would then do is say, okay, let's eat fish a bunch more, but make sure that we're in a, in a state where our nervous system is regulated, where we're not upregulated, we're downregulated, which maybe that sounds jargony, but I just mean that you feel calm, essentially. Uh, well, it makes perfect sense to me, and I would expect at least our regular uh, listeners regular and watchers, listeners. because yeah, I mean that's so. That's one of the main things regarding uh, quitting substances, as yes. you know as well. It's you're rebuilding your central nervous system because yes, drugs and alcohol destroy that so much. And so my thing was always sedatives, CNS depressants. Mm -hmm. So then, and the reason I use those is because I didn't learn this until I was in my mid thirties. I have something called sensory processing sensitivity, which I'm guessing you do too, because I can usually yep. easily just tell who other people are. Totally. And so if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's basically something to where we have deeper cog or deep deeper uh, sensory stimuli, deeper processing of sensory stimuli. So since my nervous system is so overactive in comparison to other people who don't have it, and 20% of human humans and animals have SPS. It's also called highly sensitive person. Right. So to, to regulate my nervous system, I would always do sedatives, you know, things that would calm it down. It was only when I found out that I've got this innate biological trait, 20% of humans. So too many to be a disorder, but too few to be well understood by the masses. So I think that plays into it too. So Absolutely. regarding pain, Absolutely. what you're saying is it's not a black and white thing to wear Okay, my lower back pain, for example, the reason I'm in low back pain chronically is because I've got two slip discs and I'm waiting for a surgery in six months and that's going to cure my pain for good because they're going to fix those slip discs. But if what the good doctor and you are both saying is true, and I know for a fact that it is, that, that that's it's not so black and white. The source of yes. chronic pain, this is chronic pain, not acute pain, the source of chronic pain, which is pain that goes on longer than three months Yep, is often the nervous system and brain keyword, not structural injury. So our nervous systems, our brains can actually cause pain, exacerbate pain. And if that's true, they can also minimize and cure pain. Correct. Yeah, With absolutely. That, that logic, right? Deductive logic. 
Yes, I oftentimes encourage people to look into the research of Lorimer Mosley, who's one of the great pain researchers of the world right now. He's an Australian guy, he's written a number of books, and he's done plenty of research that demonstrates you can experience pain without any actual stimuli of pain, meaning you can prep somebody. Like if I was about to say, Matt, okay, I want you to push this button, but be careful when you do, you're going to get a small electric shot, shock, get ready. And, you know, kind of, if I kind of, yeah. Uh, conditioned you to get ready for that. And then you primed had you, me for primed you. Thank you. That's the word. If I primed you yeah. for that, when you push that button, you're going to feel that maybe not the shock that you expect, but you're going to feel a sensation of some kind, especially for those of us with like higher nociception, which is what you're talking about. That sensitization here. Nociception is the the body's kind of the brain's experience of the sensations within the body. And some of us have higher levels of nociception, meaning we are more sensitized to feel those sensations in other people. So yeah, uh, I'm just reflecting back what you're saying. And I I, think this trippy stuff. I bet some people (laughs) right now are listening to this going, you know, my doctor never told me about this. He gave me oxycodone or he gave me this. He said, you know, get some steroid shots, do some stretching, do, you know, maybe meditation or something. Totally, totally. And and that's not to say, you know, I'm always really careful. Like everybody's just doing the best they can with the tools that they're provided. So I don't want to ever throw any doctors under the bus. But, uh, you know, I've asked, I had a few, I've had a number of friends and now professional colleagues that have gone to medical school and you ask them how much time they actually study pain in medical school. And there's not a, there's not a single like semester long class about pain. There's usually about 10 to 12 hours of lecture just about pain, but that's it. And most of the reason people go to the doctor is for pain. So it's fascinating that of, you know, the eight years it takes to go from like medical school to residency through all of that, they actually don't study pain that much. So or we're nutrition really... or addiction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's interesting. And again, that's not to throw doctors under the bus. Everybody's doing the best they can with the tools they have. It's just we're learning a lot more very quickly about this. You know. Yeah. The, nothing wrong with the doctors at all. They're just not specialists. Most of them, like, there's not that many epic board certified addiction MDs. There's like a huge right. shortage of it in America, and there's definitely a shortage of mind body physicians that are aware of this type of stuff that have looked at the research. It's so logical. You can't, if you're, if you're into the scientific method, this is stuff. I mean, the only people that are not looking at it or not talking about it are either ignorant. They simply don't know what they don't know or um, that. And also they don't want to be associated with this mind body stuff because, right. You know, it sounds like woo woo or it sounds like people are saying you're crazy, which is not what we're saying at all because every my human is susceptible. Real. It's not in my head. Right. I mean, and I, and I understand where people are coming from because we're, you know, evolutionarily wired. This is an Alan Gordon expression. We're evolutionary, evolutionarily wired to associate physical sensation with physical cause. That's, mm. that's how we protect ourselves. So if we happen to fall into a fire, we know to get out of it really quickly. It makes mm. sense. You know, our, our first instinct should be to say, oh, what's wrong with me physically here? But another, this is another fun study you can re- research. Is the listeners can research is Northwestern University did a study that uh, took fMRIs of people's brains and they were able to accurately predict who would go on to have chronic pain oh. based on the fMRI of their brain, which is fascinating. I mean, that shows wow. it demonstrates to you right there the actual anatomical structure of our brain influences the likelihood that we will have pain lasting more than three months. Fascinating. It's really cool. I mean, it, it 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 really makes sense to yeah. me. It's like that's like common sense because our brains are super computer control panel i think our brain can cause or cure just about anything let's let's go on to lesson two all right daniel the (laughs) context lesson two the context and the interpretation of the pain by the patient and its perceived significance are crucial Yes, I think that's a great point. You know, I, I talk about the nervous system being up or down regulated. That's kind of the language that I, I like to use that resonates with me. Um, and if we are in a constant state of worry or concern or hypervigilance about our our shoulder being busted, for example, like, oh my gosh, my rotator cuff, it, it's never going to heal. I This is the, the reason I'm having this pain, these sensations is because of this rotator cuff injury. If we're upregulated because we're constantly worried about that, that inadvertently keeps the pain alive. So essentially, if we're worried about something, we're actually increasing, we're upregulating our nervous system, which in turn can stimulate various parts of your brain, which increases those sensations. It's, Mm -hmm. again, I know it sounds kind of woo-woo, but if you actually learn to regulate your nervous system in response to those thoughts of, "Uh uh-oh, what's wrong with my rotator cuff, 
then that's those sensations will go away. You and I worked on this years ago. You know, it was let's prove to you, and you had that you had the diagnosis from Dr. Schechter, so that was mm-hmm. like the perfect foundation for it. We yeah. then demonstrated to you, oh, actually, it's weird. I can do this movement and it doesn't hurt. I just do this movement and it does hurt. And they're basically the same movement. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So when we prove to ourselves what's going on, the, that sensation can actually go down. So the cognitive experience of what we're dealing with is huge. That was a very wordy way of <laughs> reiterating no, what Shaktor said. Because, said. <laughs> no, I'm glad you explained it like that because honestly, uh, it was a bit vague. Like I understood it, but I was worried that the yep. audience would be like, what the heck? So yeah, regarding this one, my co-host, Chris Scott, for this podcast, we do a lot of episodes, just him and I together. I thought Papaya together. was the co-host. Come on. No. Oh, well, she hasn't, you know, she's she's in training right now. Yeah, she's kind of right. she's mirroring me and Chris and she's learning how to do it. She's not she'll be she'll get paid soon in, in Miller. Extra Miller. <laughs> she's she's an intern right now. <laughs> yeah, she's an intern. This is, she's loving it. Yeah. But yeah, anyways, he learned about uh healing back pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe from his dad, or maybe he learned about it and recommended it to his dad. I'm not sure. So he's had some little things with TMS symptoms, for instance. You know, all of a sudden, when he was visiting a few uh, trips ago, visiting me here, we went body surfing and he said that he stepped on, he's like, my foot hurts all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. I was like, what happened? And his foot was just like hurting and he didn't do anything to hurt or anything. And the pain just didn't go away. I think it might have been a week or two. Mm-hmm. And I was telling him, and we talked about it on the podcast that we did when he was on vacation here. He was thinking, oh, it's probably just some kind of TMS stuff. So since he had read that book, he didn't obsess about it. He's like, check it out. There was no infection or anything. There yeah. was no mark. Just just kind of just hurt. Nothing yeah. visibly wrong with it. So that would have led some people to obsessing and then the pain getting yes. people that are more neurotic obsessive compulsive tendencies or OCD. Yes. I was fucking neurotic as hell. <laughs> I was obsessive compulsive as hell. And I was hyper vigilant so much about the pain and so worried. Yeah. And gosh, as a, and you know, a lot of times my pain wasn't even really that bad. There was tension there. Right. My main thing was a lot of the times it didn't hurt, like necessarily hurt really bad. 10 out of 10, you know, it was yeah. more minor pain a lot of the time but I couldn't exercise in the way that I wanted to. Right. And that can lead to that, that hypervigilance, that OCD like behavior is like, I really want to be able to do this thing. And this is what's stopping me from being able to do Mm -hmm. it. I feel unsafe Mm -hmm. now. Let me do whatever I can to get, to get back to normal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I I do. I know. I I have to laugh because this is the world that I'm in and I talk to people every single day about this, but oftentimes Mm -hmm. I'll ask people like, Oh, any signs of anxiety or, you know, OCD or hypervigilance around the pain. And they're like, absolutely not. And then like the next question or the next sentence out of their mouth will be like, Oh, well, I do tend to research three to four hours a day about this. And it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, here we go. That's, that's a sign of hypervigilance. And I get it. We want to get out of pain as fast as we possibly can, but that hypervigilance keeps our nervous system upregulated. So. Oh yeah. And that's why for three and a half years, well, at least for the first two and a half years, cause I found my treatment team eventually, yep. but for the first around two and a half to three years, why I couldn't do it. I couldn't make much progress by myself yep. because left to my own devices without someone mm-hmm. doing counseling with me, medical interventions with me, you and Dr. Schechter. Yep. So when it was just me left to my own devices, not being coached on what the heck to do, right. it was studying, reading, listening, experimenting, yep. fearing, hypervigilant, yep. obsessive, obsessive. Yes. I, I'm atta- And now looking back on it, it was, I'm, uh, I'm unhappy with my life the way it is. If I could just exercise without fear of pain or re-injury, then I'd be in a better mood. I'd get my physique back so I could be more confident. What can I do to be able to get out of this pain so I can go surfing and go to the gym? And that shit consumed most of my entire life. And as a result, I would get 80 or 90% better oftentimes right. and then full, full back into it. Like kind of just one, one day, like, yeah, relapse mm-hmm. just and nothing physical would even happen. I just some all of a sudden, yep. boom, it would come back out of nowhere. And logically it, it's so illogical, but when you're the one in the pain, which yes. is, you know this as well, but you aren't nearly as obsessive as me <laughs> when you're the one in pain for years, just so obsessing people that are logical telling you about it. It's still, you, you kind of doubt it. Well, there has of to course. be, you know, because you're the one experiencing this shit 
and you don't have a very healthy uh, view of it. You have a lot of blind spots. So that's why I personally needed help from you and Dr. Schechter. It, it's tough. I don't, I don't fault anyone for not being able to see what's going on when you're in, the, in when you're dealing with pain, yeah. you know, I always say having pain is like having a fire alarm go off in the, in your brain. And, you know, we've all been places where a fire alarm goes off. Like you can't hear anything. It's so disorienting. You can't like think clearly. You're like, let's just get out of here. So if that's going mm. off in our brain, we can't think clearly about what's going on with us. That's, you know, totally understandable. Yeah. So yeah, I, I you were in that place, but you know, over time you were able to kind of self-regulate and get to a place where you could see what was going on. And that's what helped the pain so much of that pain diminish that discomfort. Yeah. So, yeah. And it, you helped me a lot with being more kind of not only co- super a hundred percent confident in the diagnosis, which that was so it's crucial. Once I had the diagnosis, I needed to continue to reaffirm it because you know, yeah. your mind plays tricks on you. So moving on lesson three, psychology and education can change the mind brain and cure pain, not just manage it. Well, I'm certainly living proof of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about here is the, we call it psychoeducation in, in my world and learning uh, about how your brain works can help people see what's really going on with them. And a lot of that has to do with also just you know, I remember when I was younger, before I went to school, before being a therapist, I just kind of assumed everybody's brain worked just like mine does, which is actually totally illogical when you think about it, because everybody's like physical body works differently. I'm like 6'2 and a tall, thin guy. And I would never look at somebody who's, you know, like f- four feet tall and be like, their body works exactly the same as mine. Like, no, that doesn't, that's not how that works. But I just assumed everyone's brain. And I mean, I thought, I thought that they thought the same way that I did. And it wasn't until I, you know, went to school for this that I realized, oh, wait, everyone's brain works a little bit differently. And in order to understand that, we have to do some self-reflection and kind of uh, go deeper into what our patterns are and how that might affect the way that we're feeling physically, both the way we think and the way we feel. So cognitive and emotional stuff. So, Yeah, I mean, and what we teach on this podcast is, you know, drugs and alcohol are physical substances that cause negative physical changes to a pretty important physical organ, yes. the brain. And yet when you go to mainstream treatment or recovery methods, they're doing everything but the brain. They're doing, you know, right. uh, group group counseling, individual counseling, you know, self-help meetings, spirituality. Right. Meanwhile, their poor brains are have de- neurotransmitter imbalances, deficiencies, excesses, chronic inflammation, nutrient deficiencies. Their prefrontal cortex has been eroded from drug use and their midbrain has been hijacked. Yeah. And so, so for, I find that for addiction recovery, yes, teaching people not only about the brain and what their particular substance or substances they've been using has negatively changed their brain, but then all of a sudden, which things, natural therapies and yes. other therapies even can correct those, reverse them, what can treat symptoms. And so it's really like a biopsychosocial, environmental, uh, spiritual treatment. And I think the same thing's perfect for pain rather than, okay, you're in pain. Here's some pills and here's physical therapy, you know, yes. biopsychosocial, environmental, spiritual for that too. But, you are so good. And you are so good at helping people realize that. I really appreciate that about this podcast is helping people realize everything around it. Uh, everything around your you and your person can affect the way you're going to feel and the way you're able to uh, manage getting off drugs. So, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so people are loving, I'm, I just can feel that people are loving this episode right now because it's like, we're just, we're like just knocking down myths, that, <laughs> like this one after the other people, people that have chronic pain, they're listening to this yeah. and it's making sense to them. I hope they're so. Probably already reaching out to learn more about you. Anyways, lesson. Oh, before I, before I forget, you did mention earlier TMS. I just want to make sure people understand what that acronym means. Mm-hmm. It's a, mm-hmm. it, stands for tension myoneural syndrome or tension myositis syndrome. That was an acronym that a guy named John Sarno came up with. And actually we talked about that in the previous podcast from, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Um, but I just, that's an acronym that people talk about as a way of describing mind body issues. It, it means the same thing as, you know, mind body syndrome or, uh, yeah, mind body issues. So just so people are aware of what TMS means. And then also PPD, psychophysiologic disorder. Yeah, man, you know all the stuff. I love it. Yeah, PPD, mm-hmm. that's another one. There's a the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association, which is a professional group of doctors, physical therapists, uh, psychotherapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, all that uh, understand 
pain from this perspective and physical sensations from this perspective. And they have a great website with hundreds of research articles all demonstrating this. So that's a great place for people that are looking more for more research or resources. Yeah, it's very holistic. I mean, let's look yeah. at the whole person. Let's look at their biopsychosocial, spiritual, yes. and even the environment. Yes. The, the community, you know, yeah. even the state of the world right now, the kind of collective unconscious going through this worldwide pandemic. There's so many. Uh, it's very kind of Eastern modality stuff because they've they figured this stuff out thousands <laughs> of years ago. Right? We're catching up. All right. I love this one, too. Lesson four. Pain does not always mean disease or damage. Yeah. I'm actually curious. What does that mean to, can I ask you, what does that mean to you? You said you love this one. So I want to hear what you, what your response to that is. Yeah. So a lot of people that think, so for me, Mm -hmm. I thought my pain was, I remember when I was doing a inclined dumbbell press Uh and I had drank a really, really powerful, no, sorry. The first time I I hurt myself, I was doing incline or what do you call it? Wide grip pull-ups. Okay. Yeah. I was doing wide grip pull-ups and I did a few of them. Uh, this is like a month after I quit heroin and Xanax and alcohol and all that shit. Right. I was skinny. I looked horrible. I was like, I got to start working out. Well, on that first time I did that, I, I felt a, a snap. Mm-hmm. I felt it. I heard it. I felt it. And I heard it. I don't think I smelled it. <laughs> but, um, Good. I, felt it I felt the pain. I heard it. That's and, intense. Then I, and then I got scared. So like my yeah. amygdala was like, yeah. so yeah, as a result of that. And then another time, you know, I was doing incline and I felt this up here. Mm-hmm. And so, but then, yeah, that's a reason for acute pain. But two years later, three years later, that shit really should have healed. And he, you can heal a broken bone in what, six weeks, Correct. eight weeks? Yeah, exactly. How come this shoulder right. is taking the rest of my life to do a little tiny partial tear? So that I love because... Like you said, evolutionary, evolutionarily, I love evolutionary biology. Yeah. We are wired. We have evolved to be, a, to be able to notice that. So if we put our hands in a fire and yeah. it hurts, uh, uh, uh. so our brains keep us alive. They're not evolved to make us happy and pain free. Right, right. It's, it's, a, it's functional. We're just here to, our brains are just trying to keep us going to the next day. But it's it's a lot more complicated than that in terms of understanding pain and those sensations. But yeah, you're spot on that uh, we it's natural to associate physical pain with physical cause, but that's not always the case. We have uh, we're still evolving to be able to process like feelings, for example, which I know sounds out there, but we're still evolving in order to, in order to be able to process those in a healthy way. And if we don't process them in a healthy ways, it, in a healthy way, it can cause all parts of our body and brain to go haywire. Again, you tell. You walk up to somebody who's uh, angry, tell them to calm down and see what happens. You know, you actually, that's an unhealthy way of having somebody express anger is just to tell them to calm down. They get angrier, actually. They get more upset. Whereas if you allow them to express their anger, then their nervous system actually down regulates and they feel a lot better. But human nature, we're still really bad at processing those feelings. So 90% of the time when somebody gets angry, somebody just says, it's okay, calm down, calm down, which again, only makes things worse. So that even if we don't process, that's just a small example of a way that we don't process feelings correctly or in a healthy way, it can make things worse in our body. And of course, you know, everyone knows what it's like to feel angry. You feel flooded with you know, adrenaline, you feel your, your heart rate goes up, all kinds of physiologic sens- sensations change based on feeling angry. I think I'm wandering off here a little bit, but I think you get the point here. No, you're not. <laughs> Papaya just started. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought this up because this is something that I was hoping we would we wind up at eventually. Is yeah. it, And Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about this a lot. Yes, is he does. People are living through the lens of their stress hormones, right? So you're yes. living through these. If you're getting angry, you're getting anxious, you're getting resentful, whatever. A lot of the world's like that right now. Mm-hmm. You're releasing norepinephrine and epinephrine and cortisol and those brain chemicals that you're being stimulated with fighter, a little minor fight or flight. er. Yep. Well, with those, I feel like that's going to can exacerbate pain. And he says that it's really pretty much impossible when you're living through those stress hormones to feel love and inner peace and gratitude. Yes. And, you know, fulfillment. Yes. And a lot of people are 
living like that on a regular basis. And, you know, they just haven't learned how to regulate the nervous system yet. It took me a long time to do. Yeah. Daniel, I think it was probably, I, I don't think I had like total stability until about 18 months ago, maybe. Yeah. And that's seven and a half. Now, now that's not because, you know, it just takes that long. It's because I had a lot of slips into things and workaholism, yeah. chronic pain, caffeine addiction, you know, that crazy relationship I was in at the time yeah. when you were helping me. So I, I, I went through a lot. Now my life is balanced. I've built a good lifestyle and I'm enjoying the shit out of it. So good. It does take a while for not for yeah. everybody, but the process is different for everybody. So I always want to take the pressure off to yeah. people. People feel like they need to find ways yeah. to get regulated to normal as fast as possible. And that's just not how we work with it. It does take time and actually putting pressure on ourselves to feel better. ASAP usually makes things worse, actually. Yeah, that's that's so. the main thing is, you know, it's going to take what it takes, yes. but it's okay because it can be a fun, it was a fun journey. Like I don't regret any of it. Totally. It was like, it made me who I am. And there was, it brought you, know, you here. A lot of, it brought me here. And now all the stuff I've suffered from in the past, hopefully I can help other people deal with some of the similar things. Lesson five, we just got a couple more. The severity of the pain does not always correlate with the severity of the condition or the potential for damage to the body. Yes. I mean, as I said, or I made use the example earlier of wearing two kind of very similar shoes and 10 out of 10 pain with one of them and zero out of 10 pain with the other one. There was actually no fundamental damage to those persons. I'm thinking of one client in particular, that person's feet. There was no damage whatsoever. At one point they were told, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the diagnosis. It'll come to me in a second. They were told a few, but a few different diagnoses, but it never actually really made sense. It, we looked at the evidence there and those were Doctors doing the best they could trying to come up with a, a diagnosis there. Um, and when actually we looked at the MRIs and or x-rays of, of his foot and looked at his experience of pain, none of that made any sense of why you would get 10 out of 10 pain with essentially nothing wrong with his foot. So uh, again, that's, that's our amygdala overreacting right there, th thinking that there's something majorly wrong with our foot when there actually isn't anything wrong, majorly wrong to cause pain. You mentioned it earlier about back pain. I mean, this is a very, very common thing. And even, even the general population of, uh, of doctors are accepting this now that, you know, uh, bulging discs, disc, uh, minor disc herniations, even slip disc, those things don't correlate directly to pain. You know, we can look at MRIs of um, 10 of, 10 people's backs off the street and like six, I forget what the stats are, but it's like six to eight of them will have all kinds of weird stuff going on, but only a couple of them will have pain. So we can't draw a direct correlation or causation between some sort of uh, physical issue and the experience of pain. And for somebody, well, they'll have a mild disc herniation of let's say two millimeters. Uh, the next person will have the exact same thing, but one of them will experience nine out of 10 pain. The other one will experience zero out of 10 pain. So we can see it right there. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense from that direction. So it does, doesn't hold up to science, right? It, it's been disproven in my opinion. It has right? been oh, time and time and time again, but it's a lot easier. And I, I completely understand where people come from, but it's a lot easier to just say, this looks like a problem. Let's just fix this, mm -hmm. you know, but nine times out of 10, and this is something people will uh, maybe have experienced themselves or seen in a book nine times out of 10, say we fix that mild disc herniation with surgery, with effusion, with whatever, um, uh, a symptom shows up somewhere else. So their back stops hurting and then all of a sudden their shoulder starts hurting or they get migraines or they get um, bad IBS, something like that. Because if we are- Or addiction. Or, or addiction. promiscuity, or binge drinking. Yes. Or shopaholism. Yes, exactly. Or workaholism. Why is that, Daniel? Why does that happen? That's what happened to me. I had all these different things throughout my life. I won't bore the audience with all of them, but it was just issue after issue after issue. Right. You know, and then even after chronic pain, there were other issues. Why did, and a lot of people I see that they're just going from one thing to the next, one thing to the next. Yes. So talk about why people, if all of a sudden their pain goes away one place, then usually pain will show up somewhere else or one of these other uh, equivalents, these mind body things will come out. Why does that happen? That sounds crazy. It does sound crazy to people. And it's like when I first started this work, I was like, really, is that, is it that common? And then you start seeing it everywhere with everyone. It's really amazing. You'll start seeing one symptom go away and then within a few weeks, within a few months, another symptom shows up and that sticks around for a little while. There are, again, I could give a two hour lecture on this one too, but there are a lot of reasons why that happens. But the simplest way to think about it is 
if we're in an upregulated space, whether it be because we've just had some major trauma in our life or we're upregulated because we're worried about our shoulder um, mm. and we don't learn to manage that upregulation, we don't manage to downregulate our nervous system, mm -hmm. even if we get surgery to fix our back or to fix our shoulder, we're still in an upregulated state and the brain is basically flooded with anxiety at that point, will develop another symptom as a way of telling you that things are not okay. If we're upregulated, things are not okay. Things are not, that means we're saying something is wrong. Our brain perceives our environment, our, our bodies as having something wrong. So until we actually learn to downregulate, we're going to get those various symptoms as a way of telling us, pay attention, pay attention, there's something wrong here. You see, the, you see this a lot with trauma, with people that have um, somebody close to them die or some or honestly, or going through a terrible breakup. Uh, weeks or months later, people will develop a symptom. They'll go to the doctor, they'll get it taken care of, and then another symptom will come up. And then they'll mm -hmm. get that one taken care of, and then another symptom will come up until we actually process um, the emotional content underneath that. You know, this is a terrible example, but uh, last night I was opened up Netflix and I was like, oh, I just need to watch something kind of mindless as I, as I sit here, just kind of zone out for the day. And I, I watched the show years ago, but I haven't watched it forever, but I turned on Hoarders. <laughs> which is a ridiculous show. I mean, I, I do feel it's a little exploitative, so I have problems with it. But the, right away, within the first two minutes of this episode, they talked about this woman, this poor woman who house was filled with stuff. Her best friend had committed suicide in the house. And of course, then three months or six months after that happened, the house just started filling with stuff. So that's not a physical symptom. That's not physical pain, but that's another manifestation of somebody not being able to process feelings, not being able to manage that trauma. So then the kind of our, our world starts falling apart in a way. She also did have chronic pain too, but that wasn't the focus of the hoarders episode, of course. Anyway, I digress. Um, what I always encourage people though, is go back through your own history and say like, have I had various symptoms? Have I had this before? And usually people say like, no, 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 it's just about back pain. And then once they start really thinking about it, they'll say, you know, it was weird. I did have migraines for a few months. And before that, when I was a kid, I used to always have IBS issues or that kind of stuff. So I always encourage people, look back through your own history and see if there's a, a there is a pattern of this. So. Yeah. When I looked at, I think it's the, the appendix in the great pain deception, that text, I yes. had probably 20, 25% of those different yeah. mind body ones. It was nuts. That's a great book by Steve Ozanich for those that don't know. He's, he's a great guy. I've written a couple different books on, on, on pain and chronic pain. He's a guy who went through a lot himself. So that's why he was inspired to write a book. That book is my favorite TMS book on the planet, The Great Pain Deception. Steve-O. It took me a long time to read, and I'm a voracious reader, but that <laughs> book. It's dense. I mean, it's like, it's long, it's dense. The pages are huge. The words are small. They, the, the, it is not user-friendly. He's but, a verbose oh, guy. Yeah. <laughs> the, the stuff on the subconscious and Freud and Jung. And yeah. I, I like, I like, I love that stuff, but now I'm more kind of, the science because that stuff that way of talking about it i know turns a lot of people off yes. and it is a lot more scientific than that so that's why i'm using this book because it's you know it's more digestible for most people for the masses and, and i should speak so that way it'll help for most people i totally agree with you a lot of people get turned off if we speak into like out there terms so uh, more abstract terms or abstract ways so i would try to be a, rage. yes yeah exactly <laughs> so uh actually so at the pain psychology center with alan gordon there was a team of people uh they did a research study in Colorado doing uh, basically working with people in back pain. And there was, you know, they had the, um, gosh, man, it's still early. So I'm coming blanking on all the terms, but they had basically three different groups. It was a triple blind or double blind. I'm forgetting now. Anyway, the whole point of this, I'm going to be embarrassed when I watch this later and I don't get it. No, you're not. Right. This is really cool. <laughs> when the whole point of this study was that they demonstrated that the psychotherapeutic intervention to back pain, which is essentially everything we're talking about here, yeah. was way more effective than any other intervention, which is like that, that study is about to be released. It'll be released this year. And, and it was either double or triple blind. Yes, exactly. And I got to go back and look again. I'm going to be embarrassed. And this later, is but... recent. This is not. Yeah, the study is with a colleague of mine, Christy Weepy, somebody I work with. And Alan did the stuff, uh, did a lot of the interventions as well. It's all stuff that we all came up with. And Alan came up with a lot of it himself early on. But it's all the stuff that we all practice in the mind body world. It's all of this stuff. And he kind of conceptualized it in a way that said, let's do a study. And they took fMRIs of people's brains to see how their brains would change during the study. And it turns out, it was incredibly effective to get people out of pain 
and for a long period of time for for the you know not just out of pain for a day or two it was it still lasted up to you know for most people up to this day which is now 18 months later i think so oh i can't wait till that yeah please send me that yeah i will yeah, definitely. So that's why I say like, it's not all abstract. We have actual science, mm-hmm. tons of it demonstrating how effective this is. So. Yeah, that's what I love. I love the science. Okay, lesson six, pain signals are a two-way pain, parentheses, sensory signals are a two-way street. The mind brain plays a crucial role in what you feel. So we don't really need to go deep into that. It's kind of all the stuff we've been talking. Totally. About. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say, I feel like we've hit a lot of that. Oh, And then I think we've hit this one too. Lesson seven, mind body pain keeps coming back until you are firm in your belief that there are no physical causes. And just to speak on that briefly, I won't go on too long because I know I talk too much as it is, but there is um, the reason that that is, is because when we are confident that it's a mind body issue, it downregulates our nervous system. If we're constantly worried and terrified that our shoulder or our back is broken, then we're going to stay in an upregulated place and we're going to be, we're going to stay hypervigilant. Whereas if we know, oh, this is a mind body issue. I don't need to worry about it. Inherently, it's a lot more relaxing to believe that than to think there's something really wrong with our back or shoulder or neck or whatever. So, Ooh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's continue to go deep on this because before I lose it too, at the beginning, I didn't like that. Totally. When I first, when I first read healing back pain by John, one of the first yep. books I read. Yeah. One of the first books I read, I didn't like all this stuff. I was hoping that my shoulder pain at that point could just be fixed with traditional stuff. Totally. I didn't want this other stuff to be true. Like, no, I just wanted a quick, quick, simple thing. Like, okay, this, how long does it have to heal? What do I have to do? Then yep. move on. Yep. So initially I hated that. Like, oh man. And for, for actually for probably years after learning about it, I still didn't like that. Right. But the reason I've been pain free for years and the reason I'm pain free today is because I have I have mastered this one. Pain keeps coming back until you're firm in your belief that there are no physical causes. Yep. The pain's not coming back. You know, every once in a while, yeah. there'll be a little tension, a little tension. That's not chronic pain. That's just that's ten- that's being alive. <laughs> yeah, that's being alive. <laughs> but if I wasn't confident, if I was still not confident in this stuff, I'd be like, Oh man, what's going on? And I'd be hyper vigilant. Yes. I better keep an eye on this. I'd start focusing on it. And we feel what we focus on. Then the next day, maybe the pain gets worse. Then a week later, I'm making a doctor's appointment. Like, Oh, I need neck surgery or neck. So exactly, exactly. Your response to those sensations would change the experience of them quite a lot. Yeah. So the more I learn about and not just like the physical stuff of the brain, right? Feeding yourself good, healthy foods and exercising the physical brain part, but also just our be- like beliefs. our beliefs, our thought processes, our self talk. Yeah. Those kind of things p- can play a role too. And you know, I I'm still developing skills and tools. I go along. Hey, we all are. But when I first started this journey, gosh, it, it, it seemed like so hard. And then I found. Tension myositis syndrome, yep. tension myoneural syndrome, psychophysiological disorder, <laughs> all the different names, yeah. mind body syndrome. Yeah. And then even then it was still, it took a while, but I'm glad that it all happened yeah. because now I, I've got this podcast and this audience. A lot of people have chronic pain that are listening to this mm-hmm. or anxiety or depression or yep. many other different things. Certainly knowing just how much power our brains and our beliefs and our environments and the people around us and our animals yes it's just everything <laughs> yes yeah, yeah so i got my dog here now, too <laughs> yeah yeah now before before we close off and go about our work days uh let's talk a little bit about pet therapy just throw it in because yeah because i feel like n- nature and pets uh-huh. loving with your pets and nature those are pretty good ways to downregulate your nervous system, right? Yes. I always talk about, they've done so many studies on this and you can Google it. It's all over the place. But one of the most simple ways of understanding it is that when they've done uh, plenty of studies, when somebody sits around a dog for about 10 minutes, their heartbeat starts to match the heartbeat of the dog. So you actually start having the exact same rhythms as the dog, internal rhythms as a way of soothing you. 
And I'm sure the same happens with birds. I'm sure the same happens with all kinds of animals that it actually slows you down. It's pretty, yeah, I love that. Look at that. It's amazing. Yeah. So I put yeah. papaya and I've done this in the podcast a few times now. Yeah. I hold her like this and she's smiling right now. Yeah. I can feel her purring. Yes. Oh and, and then I'll, I'll give her showers every night too. And I got this little extension and I'll make a little yes. like water park for her. That's awesome. She loves it. And water, water raises animals vibration their energetic Ooh, vibration and, and humans vibration too yeah so then once we get her out uh we'll put her in this white little soft towel and then i'll wrap her in there well, she's not but then i'll just put her right here in my neck yeah. yeah and i'll hold her like that for like 10 15 minutes and be petting her yeah and you can feel her and so we sync totally yeah so yeah. It, it's like it sounds abstract, but we You're actually have the science. Her, yeah. yeah, I'm doing it because I want to feel love, but I also want to give love. Got so it. as a result, there's like this exchange. Yes. And we do that a lot. Ashley and I and, and Papaya and I, Willow's 11, so she's not all huggy huggy like that. Yeah. But, and, and the fish, we don't hug the fish because that'd be kind of gross. <laughs> but yeah, what's your dog's name? I've never even talked oh, about your dog. Oh, Emmy. Let's see if I can show her off right there. She's passed out oh, right now. She's a beautiful. She's an old. She's an old dog. She's 12 years old, but she's she's an happy. She's a happy one. So oh, I love it. Yeah. And, and Chris, my co-host, he has two dogs, oh, a male yeah. and a female. Nice. And he just got them. I think within the last year, around that. And he's become so like he's oh, this big buff like yeah. mixed martial artist training dude. Love he's it. like hardcore, and but then he's got these dogs and he's it's making them all softer. I love and it. he's reading books on spirituality and stuff. <laughs> so he's like, because he's ten around nine or ten years younger than me. Okay, and so I, I see a lot of myself when I was his I'm age. Totally, you know, all that energy and he, he's bigger than, than I was at that age. But yeah, and so he's getting into his They're dogs and we up. Just love <laughs> yeah softening them up yeah papaya, papaya softened me up years ago as did ashley and then so there's studies oh i never heard that 10 minutes tons. sitting next to a dog yes and if you just google it you'll see it actually and they've done it mostly with dogs just because dogs are so the most common pet but a yeah. lot i mean if there's plenty of research about pet therapy and how that affects people there's also uh Tons of research about loving kindness meditation, and stick with me here, I'll explain this, but loving kindness meditation is a form of meditation where you actually sit and um, try and feel uh, feel love, essentially, and project that out towards other people. They found that there's a very similar process to when you're in a loving kindness meditation versus hanging out with an animal, is that essentially there is love coming out of us, because how can you not, like, you know, you've got a bird on your shoulder, that's adorable, like, how can you not just mm -hmm. kind of, like, fall in love with this creature right here and want to take care of it? So you actually emanate love, which does, again, this I know sounds abstract, but emanating love does have an effect physiologically on the sensations you feel within your body. And that can be very downregulating in the best possible way. So, Well, I used to take opioids to get a hit of dopamine and endorphins. Right. Now, now you pet I feel like papaya is probably <laughs> giving me oxytocin, endorphin, and uh, dopamine. That's the love cocktail. So, you know, when I was a kid, I would have watched this podcast and been like, oh, my God, these guys with their pets, they're crazy. But I love it. So. <laughs> Didn't you want to be a therapist from the when you were like in second grade or something, oh but gosh. you had forgotten about that? Did I say that on one of the podcasts? Or, yeah, there was a the podcast from a month ago you were on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there was. Uh, I'm just I'm surprised you, were, you listened to it. You remember it? Yeah, I found an old like a yearbook from second grade that said, I want to be a therapist, which who knew that that was in my head at that point, but here I am. Back, so. back then, I think I wanted to be a writer and it turns out I'm yeah, you, technically a writer. Totally, I, you I write all the time. Money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's cool. We were precious. Now let's talk about nature. Is oh. there, do you know any cool studies about that? I mean, I've read lots of them, but just totally. nothing are Off the top of my popping head. in. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of research out there about how being in nature affects you. Just even, they've done one study that comes to mind, and I have to Google it to remember who did it, but I think it was at a Northwestern again, actually. Uh, they had just had people look at a photo of nature, of either the ocean or a forest, and they measured the physio physiologic response in their body, and it had a calming effect, which is fascinating. Even just looking at a photo, not looking at, not being in nature, had that effect on people. So I used. Why do you think yes. I have this? Yes, yeah, yes. As a server, I mean, like, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so all around, and that this is the benefit of having Ashley as a girlfriend for the past going on two years now. Nice, congrats. As she is very creative and in interior design stuff. Cool. She's create so creative. So this place is, you know, I've been a bachelor a lot of my life. Yep. You know, I wasn't in a whole lot of relationships. I was single a lot. So I lived alone a lot or with guy roommates. Yep. And as a result, I just wouldn't decorate. 
And funny thing, I had no idea that a certain interior design of your home actually affects can like, have yes. such impressive, fast, and consistent like optimizations to your mood, yes. to your energy, to your clarity, to your passion for life, to your love. Totally having certain things around certain scents, you know, essential oil diffusers, scented candles, woodwick candles, incense. Lots of different mood lights and candle lights and, totally. you know, uh, uh, pictures of nature and pictures of family. So just even people optimizing their own space of where they live, cleaning and organizing it and setting it up in a, in a way that helps their nervous system yes. to come down from that upregulation. And there's even those like 4K and HD videos on YouTube where it's like you're taking a nature hike, someone's wearing a head, a helmet cam, yep. GoPro. So I'll do that sometimes if I'm working a bunch and I can't get out into nature. Just watch that video. Look, looking right out the window. But if I'm on the couch and the computer, those are the things I do because it's not as good as being in Hawaii, right? But you're looking at Hawaii yeah. on the beach, and I can tell a noticeable change. So like these are simple hacks that people don't even have to leave the house totally get a pet if you don't have one spend lots of time with your pets go into nature if you're living in a suburban jungle totally like manhattan and you don't want to go to central park then <laughs> set up nature stuff in your home what what are you doing for uh fun these days in the time that you're not working up there in portland yeah what well the pandemic has changed a lot of fun stuff i love to go see movies so that's changed a bit but i'm outside all the time i'm a i'm a pretty active person i used to lead hike therapy like i would have clients meet me in parks and we'd go for hikes that was what i love to do awesome. i don't I haven't done that as much of course during the pandemic but yeah on my own i, I go i mean my, my dog's getting older here but hiking with her is still my favorite thing we go outside and i live right across the street from the park basically i'm out in the, i'm out in the, in the woods all the time and uh the ski season's just ending here but i've been skiing a ton that's really my oh I'm, nice. yeah i'm a skiing is really my happy place that's what i look forward to every year so wow well you're in the perfect place for it then i am the perfect place. i have though you know there's plenty in when i live i lived in southern california for a very long time and i love the skiing down mammoth there too nice. so <laughs> yeah mammoth big bear totally yeah well Daniel, where can people find you and what other, so here you can plug your website or websites, any resources that you think for people to learn more for beginners, where would they go? I would definitely go to your website first. I, that's a nice of you. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, my website is mindbodytherapycenter.org. That's the site for the group practice that I, that I'm the director of. So definitely check us out there. We got tons of information there. Even if you don't want to see a therapist, there's tons of information just to read. There's so much mm -hmm. research on there, which is great. Um, also the TMS wiki is a good place to learn more information. Um, check that out. The, the psychophysiologic disorders, which I believe is PPD, PPD association.org is a great website. And if, uh, if I'm getting that website wrong, just Google psychophysiologic disorders association. Um, also my dog is snoring. So I'm sorry if you're catching that in the background. I can't hear it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, uh, where else? Uh, oh, a couple things. There's an app, a new app called Mave, M-A-Y-V, that is all about uh, pain and all about uh, teaching health. So I, I recommend Mave. Um, and the Curable app is really good. Curable is all about cr specifically chronic pain, and they lead Curable groups, and they're really good too. So both of those apps I definitely recommend. Um, there's tons of information out there. I'm also happy to talk to anybody individually if they have specific questions about what information they'd like to 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 learn for themselves, uh, use the the contact form on my website and I'll happily get back to you. I'm the one that checks that email. So happy to do that. Perfect. Too. So perfect. And I also saw on your website too, that you have links to information oh, yeah. about and links pointing to totally. a lot of good information, like all over the I place. Saw, and, and the article I wrote yes. and the first <laughs> podcast on there. Yes. Thanks for those of, links. I, of course. That's so cool. I mean, those are good. That's good resources. resources. Uh, you know, the more people learn, the better, the better we're, we all are. So yeah, there's, that's why I say, even if you're not interested in therapy, check out the website. There's tons of stuff on there. There's even yeah, exactly. like free meditations on there and there's all kinds of stuff. So, Oh, I didn't even see those. I'm going to go use one of those right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's my voice. So if I, you've heard enough of me today, you probably don't want to do those <laughs> meditations, but <laughs> thank you so much, Matt. No. This has been really fun. So this has been really fun. It doesn't yeah. even feel like work. Yeah, totally. It was great. It's just really cool. So. so thank you. Have a wonderful day. Papaya says it was nice yeah, to meet you. Too. Great to meet Papaya. I love that. Tell your but. dog goodbye. What a fun chronic thing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Matt. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs>